Hey everybody, this is Michael Jans here with the Alberta Mentoring Partnership. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Lunch and Learn Real Talk with Brock U, uh, Brock University Learnings from the Brock Healthy Youth Project. We're very excited to have Jane Morish on the phone with us, who's gonna share with us a bit about how this project will help us as uh, those involved in the youth mentoring community. We know that mentoring is a protective factor. It helps build resiliency in youth. It helps youth grow their, national, their natural supports and help ensure that they'll be resilient um, and live long, rich, fulfilling lives. Uh, and we, we, uh, we think that Jane's information will help us here in understanding our youth a little bit better. So to kick things off, first of all, I wanna select, uh, there's a poll that I have for you. So if you're in front of the screen here, you'll see a poll popping up on your computer, um, asking a little bit, it's just a test. Um, do you work in a youth mentoring agency? So. Well, we're curious if you're in the front line, if you're in a youth major mentoring agency. I know we have some researchers and academics on the call too, so we're curious to just see who's a bit in the room to, uh, to help inform Jane about who our audience is. So it looks like a fairly even split. We're about 60-40 there, so uh, that's, that's good to know. Also, I want to invite you to use our chat box. Um, so we have uh, a chat box on the screen here. And Corey is just uh, typing in, you should see a message that says, howdy folks. So that chat box you can use throughout this webinar. You can um, ask questions. If there's a, if you, for some reason you're having a hard time hearing or you wanted to uh, ask something else, use the chat box. Corey and I are watching it and we'll be able to ask the questions of Jane as she concludes. So this, like all of our webinars, are recorded and shared throughout the mentoring community in Alberta. Corey, can you show the viewers where we find the webinars? Yeah, if you want to go back and check out our previous webinars, just go to our website. It's the direct domain is albertamentors.ca slash category slash webinars. Or otherwise, you can go to the top of our website, go over to the right-hand side under blog, and go under webinars. So just jump back to the webinar archives then. So uh, whether this is your first webinar or, or you've been a regular attendee, I encourage you to go back. You can uh, click, you can get in contact with this, the, the presenters. You can get their, download the attached resources. Often there's PDFs or documents attached with them. You can also find the video um, and take a look at it. So we uh, encourage you to do that. This is great professional development for your agencies. You can use them as lunch and learns in your school or uh, in your in your community. So. I uh, encourage you to go back, there's some great stuff on there and, and it really helps us to honor the presenters by uh, uh, evergreening their content and making sure that it can be used for years to come yet. I also want to invite you to an upcoming event in Calgary, Alberta. The Alberta Mentoring Partnership will be hosting our second, uh, hopefully annual, Learning Day. So this Learning Day is May 21st and 22nd in Calgary, Alberta. There's going to be more information forthcoming, but it's a chance to have a conference, a mini conference, specifically about topics related to youth mentoring. So in the past, we've had speakers talk about evaluation, program design, match support, how to make sure that your mentoring program is effective, that you're getting the results that you want, how to deal with some of the, the challenges that we all face around grants and, and sustainability. Uh, last year, we had five different fantastic speakers in Edmonton. It was a day-long affair. It sold out virtually uh, immediately. We've got a bigger space this year. We've got 125 uh, spaces in Calgary. More details will be forthcoming, but I encourage you to register now. Uh, we're working really hard to keep the uh, event free for AMP partners. So if you're a partner of the Alberta Mentoring Partnership, um, the event, hopefully we'll be able to cover the costs. Um, the, uh, uh, if you're not a member of the Alberta Mentoring Partnership, please go to albertamentors.ca and uh, click and become a partner today. As well, while you're there, I encourage you to sign up for our podcast. Uh, all of our webinar uh, content as well as other interviews we make available as a podcast. So if you're somebody like me who has a long commute in the morning, um, getting this content is a good way to get your mind uh, uh, thinking about uh, professional development, thinking about our work and hearing from different speakers. So there's some great content up there. I encourage you to subscribe and please share it. Um, we're trying to get the word out there and we don't have a large marketing budget. Similarly, you can always find us on Twitter, social media, at Alberta Mentors. Uh, we share a lot of different content out there from our partners. If you're one of our partners, give us a follow and we'll certainly push out your good news as well too. And finally, subscribe to our newsletter. You'll find out about all of the work that we're doing, new resources, tools, all of that content. Just visit our website and you'll see one of those little pop-up boxes or you can go to the blog column and subscribe to our mailing list. So now that we've ran through most of the housekeeping, I'd like to uh, again thank our, our, uh, our speaker today, Jane Morris, for coming to share with us about the Brock Healthy Youth Project. I was in another um, meeting actually and I heard about this project and immediately I thought, 
wow, this is something that we should share with the Alberta audience. I think it's going to be very interesting. I think it's uh, uh, its methodology and and its rigor. I think will be something that'll provide us a really a really good set of, of, of guidance about what youth need and the, and some of the some of the uh, risks that youth face. So um, I'll read you a little bit of the background here. But uh, adolescence is often is often is characterized as a health paradox because it's a time of extensive increases in physical and mental capabilities. Yet mortality and injury rates increase significantly from childhood to adolescence. In fact, the adolescent years may be a sensitive time for engagement in health risk behaviors such as substance abuse, physical inactivity, poor nutrition, risky sexual activity, which can have lifelong repercussions. The question of why adolescents seem predisposed to engage in health risk behaviors is age old. However, recent work in the field of developmental neuroscience has provided new insights into this phenomenon by suggesting that brain maturation and the fact that neural connections among brain regions continue to develop throughout adolescence and into young adulthood might play a key role, resulting in unique vulnerabilities and opportunities for youth. The Brock Healthy Youth Project is a research project being led by a transdisciplinary team of researchers that aims to provide a window into adolescent brain development and health risk taking. Specifically, the BHYP is a collaborative effort dedicated to longitudinally examining health risk behaviors across adolescents through investigating interactions among brain activity, genetics, endocrine status, physical activity, personality, and environmental factors. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jane Morris, who is the Knowledge Mobilization Officer, Brock University, Center for Lifespan Development Research. Awesome, thank you. Um, hi everyone, so as was mentioned, I'm Jane. Uh, I work at, at Brock University as their Knowledge Mobilization Officer. Um, in my role, I work with our faculty members to create and maintain knowledge mobilization strategies for them. Um, let me just make sure this advances. There we go. Um, so basically I work to get our research in the hands of people that can use it. Um, I also work a lot around ensuring that Brock's research is informed and co-created with relevant knowledge users. And finally I work a lot around research partnerships with community organizations. So on that note, if anyone's interested in kind of connecting more with this project or the work that we do, just shoot me an email after the webinar and we can chat. I'm here today to chat with you about adolescent brain development and some of the interesting things that are going on during adolescence. Uh, specifically looking at something called the dual systems model of brain development, which I'll go into. Um, and then I'll spend some of my time introducing a large research project here at Brock called the Brock Healthy Youth Project. We actually call it BHYPE for short. Uh, we have a full youth engagement committee that's involved in BHYPE. They've been meeting since year one of the project, which was before we got our grant. Uh, and they named it, so we call it BHYPE because apparently that is the cool thing to call it. Um, BHYPE is a longitudinal investigation of adolescent brain development and well-being. And then we'll finish off our time together looking at some of the future directions for this work and going over any questions that you might have. So why should any of this matter to you? Um, there's actually some really interesting things going on during adolescence around brain development. And gaining an understanding of what's going on in teens' brains will actually shed some light on their behaviors and why they might be doing some of the things that they do. Basically, you're all individuals who work with youth on some level, uh, and having an understanding of the cognitive underpinnings of adolescence behaviors might actually help you work more, more cohesively with youth and design your outreach strategies and work that you do to meet youth where they are in terms of development. And you'll also get a chance to be involved in new research. BHYPE is strongly based in partnerships and the co-creation of knowledge with organizations and individuals and stakeholders. Um, and we really want to work with people that have lived experience with youth and knowledge of youth outreach and youth research. So as I mentioned, after today, you can connect with me to learn more and be more involved in BHYPE as you'd like moving forward. So I'm going to be mentioning the terms adolescence and emerging adulthood today a couple times. So I just thought I would define those as they're kind of the age ranges we're chatting about today. So in terms of our work, uh, when we talk about adolescence, we're really referring to the ages of 12 to 18. And emerging adulthood, in terms of what the research shows, it typically refers to the ages of 19 to 25, often being extended up until 29. And all of this typically can be put together under the term youth. So we're kind of looking at that large age range. Um, and later on in the presentation, I'll go into exactly the age ranges that BHYPE is capturing. So the time period in our lives that we call adolescence or youth is widely seen as a time of growth and strength. 
Uh, when we hit our teenage years, we all experience rapid increases. For example, we get physically stronger, we have mental improvements, we typically are not yet experiencing any of the declines associated with adult aging, and we're getting over some of those vulnerabilities associated with childhood. Basically, our bodies are kind of getting to their peak. We're really hitting our stride. And overall, almost in every measurable domain, adolescence is a developmental period of strength and resilience. So things should be going pretty well. However, when we look at statistics, the overall morbidity, so that refers to the amount of injuries or diseases experienced, and mortality, which refers to the amount of death, these rates increase between 200 to 300% between early school age to late adolescence and early adulthood. So basically, this is a time of your life, all of your at this time of your life, all of your capabilities are increasing and expanding without any of the drains that older adults may typically experience, yet the rate of disease and death are increasing dramatically during this developmental period. And this huge kind of increase in death and injury during adolescence is not because of things like cancer or heart disease. Typically, people typically are not getting sick. It's actually mostly attributable to injuries from preventable health risk and problem behaviors. What do I mean when I say health risk and problem behaviors? Um, there's actually a bunch of maladaptive behaviors that tend to emerge during adolescence that may lead to these increases in injury and death. Uh, these type of behaviors tend to develop or are reinforced during adolescence and are the leading causes of injury for most youth. Uh, the biggest ones are sexual risk taking, dangerous driving behaviors such as drinking and cell phone use. Um, in fact, 40% of speeding drivers in fatal crashes are aged 16 to 24 and 40% of these drivers had also been drinking. Uh, and this image here is just from Parachute Canada who works in injury prevention. That's where I used to work before I worked at Brock. Uh, and in terms of using a cell phone while driving, whether it's handheld or hands-free, it's actually been found to create risky driving behaviors similar to what having a blood alcohol content of 0.08 would, particularly among youth. Injuries from extreme sports and concussions can be heightened at this point. Binge drinking increases. In fact, 20% of high school students report frequent binge drinking. Sleep behaviors change a lot during adolescence. What we typically see is a lot of variability in sleep behaviors among youth. So your sleep patterning is all over the place and this can really mess up your behaviors. In fact, when teens enter puberty, they undergo what it's typically referred to as a sleep phase delay. So teenagers' internal biological clocks actually shift forward and they start having trouble falling asleep before 11 p.m. and waking up before 8 a.m. And this is just a natural delay that happens. And research has linked the lack of sleep among adolescents and teens to higher rates of chronic diseases like obesity, type 2 diabetes, more caffeine use, poor impulse control, lower levels of motivation, impaired attention, memory, and more. And this new science has actually led groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics to push for high schools to delay their start times so that students get more sleep each uh, night. And I actually do know that some universities are also looking at this as well because this sleep phase delay is also something that university students would experience during this time of their life. The sleep piece can also impact driving. It's been found that teen drivers who sleep less than eight hours a night are 33.3% more likely to crash than driving, well, crash while driving than teen drivers who sleep at least eight hours a night. Other behaviors that tend to emerge during adolescence or what we call youth are marked, uh, marked increase in suicide, experimentation, exposure to, and general use of alcohol, drugs, and vaping and nicotine, vaping being a big piece right now, uh, non-suicidal self-injurious behaviors, so what we commonly call NSSI, unhealthy dieting and physical behaviors. In fact, it's been found that 80% of youth are insufficiently active. And we see, um, we also see a lot around depression with 70% of mental health problems having their onset between early adolescence and young, young adulthood. Now, before I go chatting into what might be going on behind these numbers and what might be causing the emergence of these injuries and problem behaviors among adolescents, I just wanna quickly state that these are just stats and not every youth that you meet is getting hurt or dying or running out and taking dangerous risks. In reality, most adolescents have little or no problems, but there are huge individual differences around their behaviors. What is true of adolescence is that it tends to be an age period with the onset of problem behaviors. So that's why we see that jump of mortality and morbidity rates when we reach this age range. Keeping in mind that these don't suddenly decline once they hit 30, um, and data actually do show that since the 1980s, there has been a decline in some health risk behaviors, particularly among adolescents. Again, this is expected because the world is changing for youth. We're now in school for an extended period of time. So we're putting off marriage and children um, up until much later in life. 
So overall, most adolescents and youth are doing okay. I don't want you to leave here today thinking that some person from Brock told you that all youth are dying. Um, but something is clearly going on that makes adolescence a sensitive period. And while most youth will come out okay, it's really important for everyone to understand that youth are more at risk for risk-taking and problem behaviors than almost any other age range. So what's going on here? Well, it's fairly well known that early childhood, so those zero to three ages, age range, it's a really sensitive period for development, particularly in terms of brain development. And we know that what happens in those early kind of zero to three ages is incredibly important for later health and well-being. However, more recently, the, ad the idea that adolescence might also be a sensitive period has gained traction. Research is beginning to show that adolescence might in fact be a second window of opportunity around brain development, and that this age might be a critical period for increasing our understanding about how these problems can be prevented. With all this resulting in unique vulnerabilities and opportunities for youth, and for anyone that works with them. When talking about adolescent brain development, in the past it was assumed that youth just have poor reasoning and decision making skills than adults. And this leads them to make poor choices around risk. So basically, it was assumed that adolescents and emerging adults didn't have the cognitive skills to reason and make decisions in risky situations, that they weren't mature enough yet to think rationally. However, research has actually shown that adolescents perform at or very near to adult levels and better than children when cognitively assessing the consequences of risk taking. In fact, there appears to be no problem among youth when they're asked to reason about risks. So there must be something else going on. One prominent theory in research is called the dual systems theory or the imbalance model which basically talks about two different areas of our brain and how they might develop and mature along different timelines. These two systems are called the social emotional system and the cognitive control system. The socio emotional system is the part of your brain that really motivates you to pursue exciting situations and rewards. It can be responsible for that kind of excited feeling that you get when you're taking risks or you're with peers and doing exciting things. Whereas the cognitive control system is the part of your brain that kind of restra restrains rash impulses. It's basically that little voice inside of your head saying, whoa, 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 when you're about to do something or you're around people who are doing something risky or dangerous. So that social emotional system, it's part of what's called the limbic system of our brain, which again is really the part of our brain that draws us towards exciting situations and risky situations. It's, a, a, it's really a reward area. And the dual systems or imbalance model basically posits that the limbic reward areas of our brain actually mature early. Research has in fact discovered that the parts of our brain involved in the social emotional network tend to be fully active during adolescence, or even more active than adults. And this may be what intensifies adolescence affinity for rewards in exciting novel and risky situations. On the other hand, our cognitive control system, which is part of our prefrontal cortex of our brain, so that front part, that's what's responsible for our thinking, our planning, our organization, our problem solving, and it's actually much slower to develop. So if you look at the graph on the screen, it shows the asynchronous developmental trajectories between these two areas, resulting in that middle area there, the risk phase during adolescence. When our limbic reward areas, they're more highly developed and functioning as compared to the prefrontal cortex. All of this kind of results in a perfect storm of sorts, where the imbalance between, between these two areas may make youth more inclined towards exciting, novel, and risky activities, without a fully developed cognitive control system in place to keep this in check. Basically, they're driving the car, but they don't have any brakes. What's even more complex is that this imbalance is thought to be more pronounced when there's heightened emotional arousal and when they're with peers. So not only are they driving without brakes, they could also have friends in the backseat egging them on. So this is obviously an interesting area to research. The problem with research on brain development is that it's really hard to do. First, it costs a lot of money, so you, can't, you can usually only study a very small amount of people. And second, most research is done with surveys and in labs which is problematic because in those situations, people tend to make decisions alone, in hypothetical situations, and under conditions of low arousal. In fact, in these type of situations, youth decision making is often equal to adults because without real world influences, they can easily make decisions and use their cognitive control abilities. 
For example, in a lab or on a survey, a youth could easily kind of rationally use their cognitive control abilities to state drinking and driving is risky. However, that may not be how they would ask, act in a real world situation. And the reason for this is that in a lab in, in environment, youth can use something called cold cognition, which is when they're in a sterile and non-exciting environment and their cognitive control abilities have time to kick in and bring reason into decision making. And this is really problematic for research because in labs or on surveys, we not, might not be able to see what's really going on with youth brains and what they would do in real life situations, particularly because in the real world, outside of surveys and labs, adolescents and emerging adults typically make decisions in groups, in real situations, are often under control, uh, con under conditions of high arousal, and they have peer influence. In these types of real environments, this leads to something called hot cognition, which is the opposite of cold cognition. These real life environments are where the social emotional system can be firing fast and firing first. However, we do have a new research project here at Brock that's aiming to move past some of these barriers. As I mentioned, it's called the Brock Health Youth Project, or BHYPE for short. And we received 1.4 million from CIHR, which is one of the Tri-Council funding agencies, to examine this issue of adolescent brain development longitudinally. Uh, we had funding for five years, but we do have a plan to apply for further funding. And BHYPE is a collaboration between over 80, uh, sorry, 18 researchers, 80 would be a bit much, 18 researchers, and we have national and international uh, representation. We also have over 30 partner organizations from the World Health Organization to UNICEF to Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Canada. It's also just local people here in Niagara. And we also do have a youth engagement committee. And as I mentioned, they have been meeting about this project all the way from the beginning. And we actually go over pieces like our surveys with them so that we actually have a youth voice in the work that we're doing. Uh, and they are very committed to the project, which is awesome. So the purpose of BeHype is to examine the following areas longitudinally. First, is there support for adolescence being a second window of opportunity for brain development in addition to early childhood? Uh, two, how does that impact on vulnerabilities and opportunities for youth? And three, how does brain development interact with personality, activity involvement, physical health, mental health, environmental factors, etc., over time to affect health and lifestyle choices? As a whole, BeHype aims to provide, first, an integrated investigation of the development of youth health risk behaviors, two, evidence-based support, or lack thereof, for the dual systems model of adolescent brain development and its implications for youth vulnerabilities and opportunities, three, updates on indicators for health and wellness throughout the, uh, the transitions from childhood to adolescence to young adulthood that are best to target in prevention and intervention programs such as activities that enhance impulse control and positive lifestyle choices. And we're working to link all of these back to United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, those are pieces that are coming out from some of the work that we're doing with our partners, so focusing on some co-creation there. And for a timely and widespread application of findings given the strong team of researchers, partners, and integrated knowledge mobilization strategies. So what is BeHype? So BeHype is a longitudinal examination of 1,500 Niagara youth. In year one, they were in grades three to eight. Now, longitudinal is necessary to assess within individual change over time, so we can look at interactions with other systems, such as mental health and personality, again, over time, and the direction of effects over time. So we can see what is kind of coming first and what is influencing other, rather than knowing what kind of correlates. Where we are right now is that we're actually currently in the middle of year three in BeHype, so our participants are currently in grades four to 10. And what happens is that every year, those 1,500 youth, they do two surveys, and they actually do these in class. So we've got some great relationships with some of our school boards. We go into each of our schools twice a year. We have time during class, and the youth doing the surveys um, do their surveys. The youth not doing the surveys participate in other wellness-focused activities. Then we also have a mobile lab component, and that's done uh, with one-on-one -on -one with a smaller subset of our students. It's about 500 of the 1,500. What happens is these youth actually one-on-one, -on -one, they'll go into the mobile lab, and we actually hook them up to an, an, encep an encephalo, I can never say it right, I typically just say EG, uh, which is basically a measure of their brain activity. They put on their little EEG cap, they do some tasks on a computer, and we're actually able to get full readouts of their brain activity, what's going on when they're doing different tasks. We also take 
um, physical characteristics such as body mass index. We do a full a sleep assessment of these participants, so they wear what's called an actigraph, and they wear that for a week, and we can get full printouts of their sleep. We also do heart rate variability. We also collect their genetics and their hormones. So we do that through spit samples. And again, this is another longitudinal component. So these youth are doing this several times throughout the five years. Um, and we're doing that individually with them. And that's kind of an image of what our mobile lab looks like. It's actually literally a trailer with windows that goes from school to school. During the winter months, uh, we do move it inside. So we have sections of the school that are kind of cornered off for beehive in classrooms. And we turn that into kind of a, an inside mobile lab within the school. Some of the key topics that BHIP is looking at is brain development and risk taking, mental health, uh, the benefits of club and sport involvement. And in this, we do include mentoring. So we do ask them on their surveys, what organizations are you involved in? Are you involved in Big Brothers, Big Sisters? So we do have all of that information. Uh, risk taking behaviors, the onset of depressive symptoms, health and physical information. We look at injuries, um, especially some information around concussions. Uh, physical, social, and emotional well-being, bullying and aggression, and also academic achievement. But again, keep in mind we are doing two very big surveys every year, so this is just a snippet of what we're looking at. And one piece that I did forget to mention is that we also do have parent um, data as well. So we did do surveys with the parents and are continuing that. So there's overall a lot of information. For some of our early results, uh, we do have infographics that we've been we've put out. Those are right now just prevalence data. Uh, it's a wide breadth of data and topics. Uh, it does not right now include interactions and change over time. Our next information, uh, next release of infographics will include some interactions, some change over time, some of our EEG results. Uh, we've also got some EEG results for what we were calling the peer project. And I'm also going to chat about uh, what was it called our social media study. That was a, a little study that we just put out that got a lot of media attention. So I just wanted to touch on that piece as well. And I'm going to go through all of these individually now. Looking at that first piece, which was infographics. So in late 2018, we released our first version of infographics. These are just meant to be kind of short, high-level snippets of some of what we're seeing. All of these, as I mentioned, all these infographics just contain uh, prevalence data, but again, we're going to be updating them to include change over time, how behaviors may be changing each year. These are all available online. I'll also make sure to circulate them, and I've already given them out to, uh, to Corey and Michael, so they should be there somewhere. Um, and don't worry if you don't catch a lot of what I'm showing. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly just so you can see the topics, because again, I will send them out. Some of our topic areas, we did one just on uh, general demographics. So you can kind of see what our sample is looking at like. We've got one on activity engagement, and again, within here, we've got some mentoring activity that we've captured with them, and you'll see here that we do have a fair bit that are involved in activities. We've got some pieces on aggression, so this would be bullying-related behaviors, um, but just given in terms of research, we don't specifically ask about bullying, we're talking about aggression, so I've got that piece there. We have a lot of information on alcohol, drug, tobacco, and vape use. Um, importantly, we do have pre-post legalization cannabis data, so it's going to be interesting to see how some of their pieces and perceptions change around that. Um, beyond just general prevalence of are you doing this, are you drinking, are you smoking, are you using drugs, are you using a vape, um, we also ask them kind of their perceptions around it. So that middle piece there, uh, we're asking whether or not they think it would be hard to say no to their friends to do something. And on the other side in the middle, we ask if they think it would be fun or not. So we see that overall, for example, 9% think it would be a little bit hard to say no if their friends asked them to smoke cigarettes, whereas only 4% think it would be fun to smoke cigarettes. So you can see that peer influence coming out there. They think it would be hard to say no, but they actually don't really want to do it. We've got information on family relationships, so um, their perceived relationships with their mother and father figure, whether or not they're talking with them, how they feel that interacts with their life and their behaviors. I mentioned we've got concussion-related data, so this one kind of talks about what we're seeing in terms of concussion. We've got stuff on nutrition and physical activity, so if they're doing sports, how often they're eating, what their uh, food consumption looks like. We have a lot of information on their peer relationships, so their quality of friendships, whether or not they feel shy, if they feel shy with people they know well. Uh, we also have information on their romantic relationships as well. 
a lot of information on risk taking. This is just a very, very small snippet. I just grabbed to do this a couple of the risk taking behaviors that we talked with them about. We also have their perceptions of risk associated with specific behaviors. Something really interesting that came out here is that out of all of the ones that we asked them about, alcohol, smoking, marijuana, vaping, cigarettes, and other illegal drugs, out of all of them, they thought vaping was the least risky. So there's some interesting things we think going on with vaping as well. Um, and an interesting piece there with vaping is we've actually used our youth engagement committee to help us with some of the language of how to phrase the vaping questions in our survey. Um, because me as a, as a grown up, I might ask like, do you use a vape device? But I talked to my youth engagement committee and they said, no, we don't call it a vape device. We call it a vape. The stuff that we put in it, we call e-juice and we're buying it from each other on Snapchat. So we're actually able to integrate that into our survey saying, okay, do you use a vape? Where do you get your products, e.g. vape juice, and add some of our options being like, do you purchase it through social media? Because that's what our youth engagement committee is telling us that they're doing. We have information on school and neighborhood perceptions, so whether or not they're missing school, how they feel about going to school. We have a lot of information around stress and well-being, so how often they feel good about themselves, so they're feeling anxious, their frequency of worrying. We've got several scales around depression, some of their daily stressors. You'll see there that they actually know a noisy classroom was the biggest daily uh, stressor that really often bothered our youth, with 42% stating that one. Then we also have information on time management. Um, so how often they do these different activities. We do have this break broken down between what they do over a weekend and what they do on a weeknight. Just for the utility of a, an infographic, making it easy to read, we combined those. We do have those broken down as well. In terms of interesting results beyond just kind of the prevalence data, uh, we're in the middle of several studies right now. We're doing some pieces around how they feel about punishment in terms of peers, social anxiety. We've got some researchers looking at boredom, some sleep, the mental health piece. Um, but I'll talk about one of our first ones, which is what we call the peer project. So the purpose of this was to see if there is dual si support for the dual systems models hypothesis that adolescents are more likely than children to engage in risk taking when being observed by a peer and if so is it related to greater sensitivity to rewards and our procedure here I can't go into too much detail but basically we randomly assign children who are in grades four to five and adolescents who we put as grade six plus to complete a computer game while doing EEG while in our EEG um, either while playing alone or while they are being observed by a peer uh, and the youth thinks that they're winning points while they're playing this game, and that corresponds to a prize that they actually will get. So they don't just think they're playing, they are literally playing this game to get points, and it corresponds to a prize. Alone, they think they're just going to get the prize, and the peer condition, it's them and the peer that will get the prize. So basically, we wanted to empirically test the dual systems model around adolescents being more likely to engage in risks with a peer, and does their brain activity actually show what's What's going on here? Do we see some differences between adolescents and children? I'm not going to show all of the kind of aggregated EEG brainwaves for this because I wasn't sure everyone's familiarity with that sort of data and I didn't want to sit here having to explain a P3 over a webinar, which is not probably the best form of knowledge mobilization. So I just wanted to summarize basically what we're seeing at a high level. If you have more questions, please just send me an email because I promise I have more slides on this um, and I can go into more detail, but this is very high level. Um, basically what we found was that there were significant differences in their EEG, and I keep in mind that's brain activity. So their brain activity responses for adolescents, but not for children. What we found was that everyone in general paid more attention to losses than wins, which we didn't expect at first. Um, we thought that everyone would pay attention to the wins more, uh, but when we looked in the literature, it's not really that surprising. Uh, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. When you when you lose money, you just that that feeling of, oh, no, I lost, and you focus on it, versus when you win, that's great, I won, but the loss can really stick with you. The big piece is, uh, is that the attention to losses was even stronger for adolescents when they were with peers. The, Again, if I'll sh I can show the EEG, it's another time, but their EEG response when their losses in front of peers is significantly different and just very clearly different with our results. 
So overall, adolescents do appear to be more sensitive to peer present, presence when making decisions than children, and this is being shown in their underlying unconscious cognitive behavior. It's not just that they're getting excited and they're doing it. Their unconscious behavior is showing that they are more sensitive to peer presence when they're making decisions. We teased that apart a little bit more. It seemed that half of um, adolescents seem to be worried about negative evaluation from their peers. Those are the ones that uh, paid greatest attention to losses. And the other half seem to be excited and they think it's fun when they're in risky situations with their peers. And now what we're doing is working to pull apart within those groups, what are the individual differences? Are some of them more socially anxious? Are some of them uh, more, uh, more risky than others? What, what's actually happening within those groups? Um, but the big piece is, is that first, the results show that there is a peer effect among adolescents. And this, again, is empirical support. I imagine that a lot of you are thinking, well, of course, peers are important. But now we actually have some empirical um, evidence showing that unconsciously this is also in affecting their brain activity. And the results support the suggestion that adolescence is a sensitive period for social influence as compared to childhood. So peers are becoming increasingly important, and peer all influence may especially be impactful during situations where, with heightened arousal, like risk-taking. So in general, we should be taking peers into account when creating and running any sort of outreach program for adolescents, and because this is literally something that unconsciously is impacting what they're choosing to do. The next study I wanted to chat with you about is our social media study. Um, so as we all know, social media has become an important communication tool for youth to stay connected and socialize with their peers. Uh, this has prompted a lot of research interested in identifying how social media may affect today's youth. Some recent research has indicated that there may be an association between greater social media use and higher depressive symptoms among adolescents. This association has been interpreted as social media use leading to greater depression. However, to make this claim, longitudinal research investigating the same people over time is needed. We actually have two large longitudinal studies that allowed us to address this question more among adolescents and young adults. The first one being BeHype, which we've chatted about. The other being a previous study called Stressed at Brock, which uh, surveyed 1,100 first-year Brock University students annually over seven years. And that's a recent sample as well. It only uh, finished up a couple years ago, so it's recent information. And in both of these studies, we have annual self-report measures of well-being and reported average time spent engaged in social media, along with numerous other measures. But for this study, we were lo really looking at social media and well-being. And in both of our samples, we found that social media use did not predict greater depressive symptoms over time for males or females. Instead, greater, depressor sim greater depressive symptoms predicted more frequent social media use, and that was only among adolescent girls. This finding con contrasts with the idea that people who use a lot of social media become more depressed over time. In fact, what our re research shows is that it perhaps adolescent girls who are feeling down may turn to social media to try to make themselves feel better. This finding highlights the importance of testing multiple different explanations for why a relationship might exist. We believe that this work is important for a wide range of audiences. Uh, when parents read media headlines such as Facebook depression, um, there's an inherent assumption that social media use leads to depression. Uh, policymakers have also recently been debating ways to tackle the effects of social media use on mental health. And our social media study highlights that the sphere of social media may be premature. Um, of course, we still need more longitudinal studies replicating our findings um, before we, any of this can become more definitive and more conclusions can be made. Around social media, in the future, we think it would be really beneficial to look into individual differences. There may be different groups of people who use social media for different reasons. Uh, for example, there may be a group of people who use social media to take to make social comparisons, who turn to it when they're feeling down. Um, well, another group of people may use it for more positive reasons, such as keeping in contact with friends. In addition, it would be really interesting to look at how the quality of social media use um, for example, using social media for social comparisons versus active versus passive engagement, and the type of social media, how all those pieces might be associated with well-being over time. And again, that over time piece is really key to really get at the direction of, of effect between um, these relationships. So what is, what's next with BeHype? Um, big piece, additional knowledge mobilization. 
Um, really focused on co-creation with partners. That's a piece we're entering into right now. Uh, producing some videos. So you'll probably see some whiteboard videos coming out uh, with our results moving forward. Uh, media and social media, public and practitioner outreach initiatives, that's a big piece. We do 100% have data on involvement in mentoring activities. Again, like I mentioned, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Uh, and what we're going to be looking at next in some of our work is, is, do we see this as maybe a protective factor? How can this, um, how can mentoring impact some of this over time? Where is the relationship going? Do, do youth that have certain individual differences tend to go towards mentoring more and what does that relate to over time and other behaviors how does this relate to navigating complex peer relationships um, we know that adolescence is a sensitive time for peer influence does mentoring have any kind of mediating or moderating effect in there uh, in year three we're going to be looking at more at change over time and additional eeg results we've got three publications in the works a bunch of our team is literally on a plane to baltimore right now to present some of those uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of that coming out and then our big piece um, is that next year we'll be going for what's called a Shirk Partnership Grant. So we want to take this work that we're doing with Beehive and expand it to a national level of uh, partners working together to look at this idea of youth transitions together. Um, big Brothers Big Sisters will likely be involved in that. And again, we're looking at other organizations to be involved in that. So if that's something, if Beehive, any of this aligns with what you're doing, so uh, please make sure to connect with me. I know this is a really big slide, but I wanted to throw up some additional reading if people are interested in any of these stuff, because this a lot of this base research has been done by phenomenal researcher researchers around the world. So I just wanted to throw up some pieces around different pieces that you can read, and I'll make sure these slides are available. And that is it for my presentation. So I think we've got some time for some questions. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. I'm. Uh... It's funny in Alberta. There's been a, a whole series going um going on called Growing Up Digital, where the uh, um, the Alberta Teachers Association has brought some uh, uh, researchers in whose names I'm I'm missing right now. But it's part of um it's looking up the effects of uh, digital technology, sleep deprivation, social media, etc. And there's some really interested interesting preliminary findings there that um uh seem to seem to somewhat uh, be contradicted by the the social media work that are, that, that you found so um, yeah there was a, it was uh, we just put this out we got a lot of media around it as well because it is very contradictory because a lot of research shows that other research was showing that there is an association um, so it's, and that, I think there's a whole group of people now including beehive researchers that are working together to try to tease apart these individual differences and in direction of effect piece yeah yeah the the one thing the research said is well we do know that if you have your phone with you in bed you're probably not sleeping you're probably cutting yes. down on sleep which leads to all these other mitigating factors so whether it's because you're doing words with friends or because you're on instagram um it's you know there's a, a number of different um behavioral things that are impacted by social media that you're more likely to um see decreases in mm -hmm. in, in sleep and other other important uh, building block behaviors Definitely. And we did not, um, we have all, of, um, so for the sleep, they wear something called an actigraph and we haven't correlated that our sleep piece with their social media. So that would be another interesting piece to do. Interesting. Um, uh, we had a question here from Victoria who asked, are you able to access da data from the schools on things like suspensions, expulsions, absences, and special needs coding? So the one thing that we do have from the schools is grades. So we've got their grades, and that's actually coming right from the school board. The parents consented to that on the consent form. Um, we're working with Niagara Partners to see what other data we can get from around from other pieces. As we recognize the self-report piece is just a snapshot, even though we have the uh, uh, the mobile lab piece. So that is in the works. Uh, we're also working with some of our partners to see um, how, how and if some of our participants are accessing resources outside of the school board. So in Niagara, we have something called Past on Mental Health, uh, which is a mental health agency. Uh, so we're looking into some of that. All of that's going to involve some going back to the parents to make sure that we get some sub pieces of consent. Um, we have great, great, great retention with Beehype. They are staying. This is a club that we're in, but that's because we have such an open connection with our parents. So we're looking into that. So great question, Victoria. We are on it. Um, it's just that a lot of different moving parts. 
Another question I had is, um, so I know you're in conversation with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Canada, as well as other youth mentoring agencies. So for those of us on the webinar who are interested, um, uh, naturally, in my mind, went to the impact of peers and the research that you're doing there. I would think that the um, you might find some, uh, my hypothesis would be that um, you'll, you'll have some great data coming out of this about the roles of mentors or caring adults as positive role models. Has any, anything been explored around that? We have the we have the data. Um, it's we're at a point now that we've got such a clean uh, data set. We had to wait until we at least had some change over time. Um, so for that piece, we have it, and it's something that we would look at. It's just again getting into it because if you uh, keep in mind, we do an hour survey with them twice a year, fifteen hundred of them. But that is something that we're now moving into right now that we're just about to finish year three. Um, we'll get that in there. So we've got it all. It's just making sure that we actually get it out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the impact of peers and positive peer groups was certainly that was another uh, thing that stuck out to me from from your presentation. So certainly appreciate that. I guess um, um, from here, maybe maybe uh, um, being mindful of the time, where to from here? So I, I would love to have you back in 12 months and to say, where are we now and to see what what's coming up. But is there a better way you prefer that the Alberta community connects to your, to your work? A um, couple different pieces. I'd be happy to come back in a year, um, but what I also can do is just make sure to to connect with um, on the kind of front end, you guys, um, Corey and Michael, saying here's what we have pumping out when we've got new publications and pieces like that. Like when that social media thing came out, I could send you the media that we did about it, so you have it. Uh, when our infographics come out, which should be in the next couple months, sending those along. Um, so I'll just, on my end, make sure to kind of add you to my my big distribution list to send out what we have, uh, and then you can circulate uh, what you think is appropriate and relevant, and then definitely come back in a year to to do the, another webinar to show where we're at and what's happening, uh, and then also keep you guys informed around that Shark Partnership Grant, because those dollars are really going to be meant to bring us together, um, so that would be an exciting piece to explore together. Yeah, this is, well, this is most... Uh most interesting and thank you again for for sharing with us and taking the time um seeing no further questions in the queue i i uh i was wondering uh, actually we do have one question just popped up how do we get access to the slides so uh corey what what's our plan for distribution here are we able to email the presentation and jane if you share the present the powerpoint are we able to share that with the audience yeah for sure i'll i'll get it i'll clean up some of the little pieces in there and i'll send it out when we're done Awesome, and then we'll pass it on to the to the registrants. And that'll be included in uh, the follow.